Now it is time to start, so shall we start? The Asian Dramaturg Network meeting, this is the last part, and this is Japan and Dramaturgy. We have three speakers in this session. We have Mr. Kaku Nagashima, and he is a pathfinder of dramaturgy in Japan. And he has been cooperating with many companies and uh, plays, Peckett, Sarafain, Alan Harris, Shakespeare, Ibsen. And he has been translating all these uh, authors. And also, he is a member of Nakano Seik and Flunkins. The next person sitting here is uh, Mr. Uh, Ken Hagihara, and he is a professor of the sc School of uh, Gra Global Japanese Studies, Meiji University. And uh, Sanoseki, the person and the works, 1905 to 1966, and uh, he has uh, written uh, many other books. And uh, the person next to me is uh, Mr. Peter Egasal, and uh, he is professor of uh, theater and performing studies and uh, executive officer of the PhD program in theater at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. And he is also vice president of uh, a performance uh, studies uh, international. And uh, he is a dramaturg for Australian Arts Company. And so uh, we have the, uh, the authorities about Japan in dramaturgy. Uh, first, uh, let me uh, listen to Professor Hagiwara. And each speaker has about 20 minutes to speak to be followed by discussions. So Professor Hagiwara, please. My name is Hagiwara, uh, ADN, TPAM, and uh, well, uh, other organizations are involved in the meeting, and I would like to express my gratitude. I am um, here in this session because Mr. Takiguchi asked me to speak here in July last year. He uh, asked me to speak in a certain meeting in July. And that uh, topic of that meeting is related to the topic today. Mm, I can speak German. And uh, when a performance is invited from Germany to Japan, I translate the scripts for the, the German uh, works. And uh, in Rimini Protocol, well, this was a really exceptional work. So let me start. And this is the structure of uh, and the contents of my presentation. There is introduction for those people who don't know Rimini Protocol. And then after that, I would like to talk about the uh, three performances in Japan in which I was involved. And all these three, well, there was an original that, that those were adapted to Japan. So I would like to talk about what was the original and what was the adaptation for Japan. And lastly, I'll talk about, uh, well, I'll uh, present conclusion. First, let me talk about the Rimini protocol. This is the brief protocol. There are uh, three directors, two German from, and uh, also one a Swiss. So there are three directors. There are no professional actors belonging to this group. And uh, no existing uh, play is used, so no existing script is used. Lay presence appear in the performance. So lay, lay presence are performers. And remaining protocol call them experts of every day. The experts that suit the theme or appear in Rimini Protocol performances. In those uh, 
presented as guest performances. And there are some adaptation to suit the uh, local characteristics of the place where the performance takes place. So this is the first of the three that I would like to talk about. This is Karl Marx, The Capital, Volume 1, Tokyo Version. This was performed in Tokyo in February 2009. This is the original version, Karl Marx, The Capital, Volume 1. This was performed in Dusseldorf, Germany in 2006. There are eight so-called experts on the stage. And those eight actors uh, involved directly or indirectly uh, to the uh, Karl Marx, the capital, like a professor of economics at university uh, or former management consultant or activists. The text that was used was the um, interview material. These experts are interviewed in advance, and those uh, experts are not notified that, that they, was, they were going on to the stage. But the uh, excuse used for the interview is that uh, the research was going on about the capital. So uh, they received this interview, and then uh, the directors uh, choose who they want on the stage. And then the director tell them that, that this is uh, the casting uh, selection procedure. So eight experts go onto the stage. So before that, about 100 people were interviewed, and then eight people are selected from among the 100 interviewees. And during the interview, the uh, remarks are recorded, and those re remarks are spoken on the stage. So uh, these words, the lines, are uh, the uh, line that, that they uttered on the stage. Part of the text from the capital is uh, spoken. This is what happened uh, during the uh, performance in Japan. Rimini Protocol wanted some additional Japanese performance, for instance, Japanese professors of economics or Japanese activists. And therefore, the same process was executed. Interviews, well, they're, noti they're not notified that uh, this is a screening process, but interviews are carried out. And then uh, those uh, uh, texts during the interview may be used on the stage. And a part of the German lines were cut because the total length of the uh, play was kept the same. And also, the text of the capital in Japanese translation. Some of the lines from the capital in Japanese translation are spoken on the stage by those expats. And this is what I did. During the research and casting, dramaturg and uh, uh, directors collected the information and they carried out interviews. So I translated in those meetings. And also uh, there are original texts in Japanese. So I translated Japanese into German as subtitle. The remaining protocol said that uh, they wanted interpreters to uh, assist communication between uh, German and Japanese uh, castes, and um, it was not possible to find an interpreter. So I was asked to interpret on the stage. And therefore, I worked as an interpreter on the stage, and also I operated the subtitles. As a result, I was one of the actors on the stage. 
and this is the uh, schedule of preparations and interviews who was interviewed and uh, uh, where I went to assist in the interviews as indicated in this schedule sheet. And lastly, on the stage, this was a direction. I am um, on the right-hand side photo. I'm in the back in the left-hand side on the right photo. The next example is Cargo Tokyo Yokohama in November 2009. There was an original one, and the original one was called Cargo Sophia X. It was performed in Basel, Switzerland in 2006. This was the first performance, and uh, uh, this uh, traveled to other cities in Europe. The concept is as follows. From Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, to the uh, city where this is uh, supposed to be performed. This is virtual. So uh, the place of performance is called X. So this is a virtual journey. The major performers were these two people. From Sofia, capital of Bulgaria, and this is a uh, truck driver, Bulgarian. And uh, also the folk song singers. So uh, the concept is that uh, this uh, truck travels many countries across national borders. The audience is uh, supposed to be transported on the truck. And uh, they travel to places uh, uh, that are associated with this truck driver. The text used, just like the first example, well, interviews were conducted with truck drivers, and the, uh, the lines from the interview are to be used in the performance. And uh, the casts are selected based on the decision of Remini uh, protocol. So uh, they interviewed 20, 30 people and selected two. And the actual topic is logistics or transportation. And uh, subtitles is uh, shown for the audience, especially uh, scandals related to logistics or projected on the screen in subtitle in front of the audience. And this is adaptation. Well, in Japan, there is no national border because we are surrounded by the sea. So how shall we adapt to Japan? So at the end, a Japanese truck driver and a Brazilian Japanese truck driver was selected. And this is a virtual transportation. The virtual transportation cannot be from Sofia to Tokyo. So what was done was, uh, well, a hypothetical virtual transportation from Niigata to Tokyo. The actual transportation, actually where the, the truck drove was from Tokyo to Yokohama. And uh, there is a long tunnel between Tokyo and Yokohama, and also uh, the virtual route from Niigata to Tokyo. So tunnel was the, the common thing between the two. And this is what, is what I did. I acted as an interpreter during the interview. The interview meant the cast selection. And uh, for the uh, rehearsal every day, we were uh, thinking about and decisions were made as to who needs to say what and what rules should be taken. And uh, the, I was uh, updated about the latest decision. And um, I needed to organize what was decided into Japanese text. And those are uh, sent to me from the directors in uh, English or German, and uh, I needed to translate into Japanese. And so Japanese translation is to be sp spoken by those uh, two actors who are acting as truck drivers. 
And also in this case, Japanese candles on the logistics are written in English or German by those directors, and I translated the uh, those uh, uh, information about the scandals, about logistics in Japan. Please do not take photo of this screen. This is the uh, personal information of a truck driver. This is a, 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 sorry, a Brazilian Japanese uh, candidate. And this is a script. And uh, where, what takes place, and which one of the truck drivers say what is indicated, and also uh, what uh, subtitle information uh, should be projected is shown here in time series manner. And this is, well, not exactly stage photo, but uh, this is uh, how it looked. I prepared a movie, but uh, because of the time constraint, I decided not to show you the movie. The third example, 100% Tokyo, November 2013. This is the original version. This is called 100% uh, Berlin, performed uh, in 2008 at the uh, occasion of a celebration of 100th anniversary of some theater in Berlin. 100 uh, residents, well, the general public, are on the stage. And about the casting, the uh, first person that was selected was the uh, statistician of this town. And this statistician invited the next person. The next person invited the next one. So this chain reaction method was used to gather the uh, actors. But there is a quota. In the case of Berlin, 50 uh, people had to be men and 50 had to be women. And also some um, age quota was uh, uh, imposed. So it was uh, more difficult to find the 99th candidate or 100th uh, candidate because of the existence of these quotas. So anyway, 100 lay persons, the general public, are gathered and they move around on the stage. It's just like uh, the uh, questions are bombarded on the uh, stage, and they move around the stage based on yes and no, and uh, sometimes multiple options may be provided. So this uh, concept is that uh, these people epitomizes the uh, town. The concept uh, was not uh, very different when it came to uh, Tokyo. The difference was the contents and nature of the questions, because the questions in Tokyo had to be in line with the context of Japan, like uh, the imperial household, earthquake, a nuclear power plant accident, Olympic and games in Tokyo. Those were the questions in Tokyo. And this is what I did. The uh, first actor decided was a statistician from Tokyo Metropolitan Government, but uh, he had some problem. So uh, I uh, had to ask the professor of statistics in my university to appear in the stage. And then uh, 100 people are interviewed. The interview the uh, interviewer was a uh, uh, Japanese speaker, and the information was sent to me, and uh, I translated them into German or English, and I uploaded the translation on the virtual space. And uh, the directors in German, Germany look at my translation from the virtual space, and I started preparation. And also, I uh, recommended questions that are in line with the local contest. There are 100 actors, and uh, there are directors, associate directors, and uh, others. Many stuff was uh, required. And uh, also, uh, I assisted in um, making lines for people to speak. And I'm living in um, Tokyo, so I was uh, on stage also. And uh, these 100 people moved 
uh, between yes and no to a question. And uh, the uh, question is projected uh, in the back. And uh, people who meet the uh, criteria of the question may gather at the center. And also, there are some um, multiple options given in some questions. And this is about the earthquake. The question is, what do you do in case of an earthquake? And there are different options given in different colors. I have uh, a video, but be because of the unconstrained, I'm not going to play the video. This one here is schedule of preparation. They, there are three people, director, associate director, and technician came from Germany and from Japan. We have assistant director who can also speak English and drama track. A German person, but uh, this German dramaturg spoke very good Japanese. So because uh, there are 100 actors, we needed quite big stuff. The German dramaturg was not living in Japan, so I had to assist him understand the context in Japan. So for this uh, purpose, I volunteered to act as an associate dramaturg. And this is my last slide. The first work, Karl Marx, this was my title. A translation and operation of the subtitle and uh, interpreter. This was my title. The second work, Kago Tokyo Yokohama, my title is this one. Preparation of the Japanese text and interpret. The third work, the third piece, my title became Associate Drum Talk. And this is the uh, idea that I, together with uh, a number of uh, other people, came up with. There was a, a four year difference, and in um, Drum Talk in Japan, these are uh, the thing that happened. The book title Drum Turk was uh, published, written by Mr. Hirata of Keio University. And also in Waseda University, there was a program for developing Drum Turk started. And uh, uh, Professor Fujii led this initiative, and uh, he is here. So the uh, word dramaturg is now uh, starting to be recognized. But even before that, um, I was uh, uh, having uh, some work related to dramaturg. And I think I was an interpreter of context or information provider or perhaps joint producer, maybe. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you. So uh, let's move on uh, to uh, Mr. Nagashima. Hey, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kaku Nagashima. It's my pleasure to be here. So at first, I would like to uh, extend uh, my uh, gratitude uh, to uh, ADN, uh, Asian Dramatics uh, Network uh, meeting, uh, the people involved in that, as well as in the STEPAM. Um. So as for myself, I uh, carry uh, the title of uh, dramaturg, and uh, just as um, Hagiwara-san uh, mentioned, uh, perhaps um, without um, people uh, knowing, um, I have uh, been using this uh, title for, as a, a dramaturg uh, for about 20 years. So how dramaturgs have been developing uh, in Japan, I would like to um, talk about uh, two works uh, to uh, inform you what has been happening in Japan. So when I first entered the, uh, the theater scene, I uh, actually was a translator. So as it was, um, it, as I was introduced uh, earlier, I was uh, translating um, the, uh, the script um, on the plays uh, from Europe uh, into Japanese. 
But the translations, when I did translations, it made me realize that uh, actually translation that I do carry my own interpretation. Because uh, when you translate into Japanese and uh, the works from European languages, already uh, the translator's interpretation goes into the translation, uh, into the Japanese translation. This means that um, this uh, interpretation is already uh, there before the actors or the directors actually find their interpretations. And that made me quite uncomfortable because I myself am not a director and I'm not an actor. But uh, it made me feel as though I was in a position to make a certain decision, uh, bringing my own interpretation into the translation. So I started to participate uh, in rehearsals um, of the plays and I uh, started to uh, work uh, together with the directors and uh, actors. Of course, this meant that um, you know I was still involved in translation, but I would also be sharing information uh, with the actors and the director and um, providing information so that uh, together uh, we can collectively find interpretation uh, for the play. So I was uh, doing that in the early part of 2000, but uh, gradually. Um, this made me uh, the, created the situation that I was doing something more than just a translation. I was doing something um, more additional and uh, extra. And um, just as uh, Hagirawa-san was uh, saying, uh, Mr. Hirata, Professor uh, Hirata uh, from Keio University, um, he actually came back uh, from Germany in 2004 and uh, happened to meet uh, with uh, this Japanese academic, uh, Mr. Hirata, and he told me that uh, there is a profession in Germany called uh, dramaturg. So um, I realized that um, you know what I was doing was uh, dramaturg because that's what he told me rather than a translator. So suddenly from that day on I became a dramaturg. Uh, of course, with that, um, you know, having uh, talked with um, Mr. Hirata, I would have, would have known that what I was already doing was known as a dramaturg. And this, of course, term uh, dramaturg was not uh, at all familiar. And in Japanese, uh, this is regarded as something that um, people don't know what a dramaturg means or what it takes uh, to be a dramaturg. And sometimes uh, there will be a misprinting of the uh, dramaturg, or I would be called a Mr. Took, or it was uh, it was not uh, correctly translated into a dramaturg. It was a quite a void and empty kind of a uh, word, uh, dramaturg. But um, I was uh, doing more of a collaboration uh, with the director and the actors, much more than what a, um, the translator usually uh, does. But um, I became a dramaturg. So um, I started to uh, take on this title of a dramaturg uh, from about 2007. So after this, I just want to uh, talk about uh, some of the uh, one of the early works that I was involved in. Um, one work that I just want to cite as an example. Uh, well, let's just uh, look at the, some of the images uh, without going into too much uh, details. And uh, the work is called Atomic Survivor. This is the work from 2007. And uh, this is a uh, work uh, which takes up uh, nuclear energy as its theme. I will switch off the sound. Now, as I said, um, this is the work based on the theme of um, uh, nuclear energy, nuclear power plants. So this is almost like a um, documentary uh, theater and um, also post-dramatic dramatic, uh, documentary. And the director is called uh, Hatsumi Abe. And the work uh, is about um, how nuclear fuels are made, produced, and uh, used in Japan. Um, because um, we in Japan don't uh, know the entire picture about the production and uh, the usage of uh, nuclear fuels. So the concept of this work uh, is to uh, depict that and to provide information about that. And in this um, work, the actors uh, actually 
uh, in uh, from the stage of uh, how the uh, the materials, the raw materials, uh, uh, imported into uh, Japan, and uh, how they are converted into uh, nuclear fuels and used in nuclear power plants, and how they are discarded or how they are recycled. So uh, the idea was to make it all visible, uh, this entire nuclear fuel cycle. And a great amount of research went into this, and um, the actors um, uh, actually uh, um, were involved in the, uh, the research, did the demonstration uh, on stage. And most of the lines are spoken uh, by the uh, actors on stage are taken from the publicity uh, materials of uh, uh, electric power companies in Japan, uh, which use nuclear energy. So this is all about uh, how nuclear energy is so um, wonderful. And uh, also the models that you see on stage uh, of the, uh, the, all the things which are found in nuclear uh, power plants are uh, made of cardboard box cardboard materials, and uh, the actors actually use those uh, props and move those uh, props in order to uh, demonstrate um, how this nuclear fuel cycle uh, functions. Uh, so this is uh, collective uh, work, and uh, it was not as though there was a script uh, right at the beginning. So the actors um, with us actually collected uh, information materials. We went to nuclear power plants. We met with people, and uh, we gathered uh, information and uh, materials. And spontaneously, uh, the scenes were created and uh, put together uh, into this uh, one work. Now, during that time process, I was uh, leading the research work, and I shared the concept with everyone. I edited uh, the text, and I put together all the uh, elements uh, as a work. And actually, the text from some uh, Chekhov's work uh, was used. Uh, this is from Uncle Vanya by Chekhov. In Japan, the nuclear energy issue uh, evolves around the fact that uh, the electricity, which is used mainly in cities, uh, actually are sourced from fuels, uh, which are produced uh, in the countryside in the rural area. So uh, Uncle Vanya and Chekhov's work, as you know, is that the other work, um, much of the other work uh, to earn money in the countryside are sent uh, to the uh, the uh, city uh, for an Aquabania to uh, work. So, so there's a bit of a uh, similarity there. So at that time when this work was actually uh, performed, uh, it carried both the humorous and uh, bitter aspects, but uh, because of the 2011 uh, nuclear power plant accident, which happened uh, in Japan, uh, this uh, work uh, became very bitter. And uh, I personally feel that um, we are no longer in the situation that um, we can uh, put this on stage again. So it's um, called Atomic Survivor, uh, the work back in 2007. Now, as a dramaturg, uh, what I started to do to simply describe it, I think I do two things. Um, uh, with a director or the actor, well, with a team, I create a concept and I work with them to put together a concept. And another part of my work is that uh, the creative process or dramaturgy, um, I um, actually take care of those things. So these are the two um, important uh, works that I do. Making concepts means that, uh, of course, this comes uh, way before uh, when the actors and everyone start to do a rehearsal. And I think of uh, this concept as like a home. And when you solidly build this home, the concept, even if you become lost, even if you're away from home, and if you become lost, you can always come back uh, to that home. So that's what the concept is like. And that is why the concept is so important. Uh, if the concept is very simple and very strong, it's all very good. And um, I work uh, with the director uh, to come up with that uh, concept. And dramaturgy, this is my understanding. Uh, 
in terms of um, the concept, dramaturgy is not something that is fixed and uh, rigid. It's something uh, more uh, flexible and malleable, and uh, you can be um, discovering um, things during the process. It's more generative. So that is why during the process it's very important to share the concept, and you keep on having a dialogue and uh, communication with the director, and uh, you work with the team, the director, and the actor in order to nurture that uh, concept. So, as I said, you know, I take care of that um, uh, process and the concept, so that's one. Now, I started uh, to take on work, uh, which was uh, increasingly um, known as a dramaturg, as a profession, without my knowing. Uh, but another important um, part of my work is that I don't make the final decision. The Decision-making uh, finally uh, rests with the actors or the director or the producer. That's my opinion. So it's not myself, it's not me who makes the final decision, but whether that final decision is good is it really good? Uh, in order to uh, look into that, in order to investigate whether that final decision is good, of course, um, you know, I attend lots of um, uh, rehearsals and practices. I gather lots of materials and I do lots of discussion uh, with the team. In other words, dramaturgy is a uh, like a one zone or a place where you work collectively, collaboratively with the others. So you are working together with others, and uh, it, dramaturgy is like a place uh, where you nurture and foster something. Um, but uh, that does not belong only to the dramaturg. Uh, it's more. It um, belongs and uh, and is owned by everyone, or even by the work itself. And um, the work of mm, mm, a dramaturg is to take care and uh, to assist. Now, um, as you uh, watch uh, this um, uh, video clip of uh, Atomic Survivor, you get an idea, but it's a very heavy uh, kind of uh, work. Uh, let me move on to the next work that I would like to uh, show you. This is not a play, this is not a theatrical work, but this is quite a new example, a new kind of artwork. Um, this is a part of the other uh, project which was going on until December of last year as part of an art festival called the Saitama Triennial Triennale. And Saitama is a prefecture which is a bed town to Tokyo. It is uh, situated uh, north of uh, Tokyo. It's a neighboring prefecture to Tokyo, and it is just an art festival. And um, this uh, project was part of that uh, triennial. This is a participatory art with no performance, but I myself uh, brought in uh, the way of thinking as a dramaturg uh, to lead the project and to um, let the uh, project um, proceed. The work of the, uh, the sorry, the title of the uh, project is called uh, Yajirushi or Arrows uh, in English, and um, this is uh, inspired by a Japanese playwright called Shogo Ota, and actually he did a, he came up with a, a series of uh, plays entitled uh, Yajirushi uh, Arrows. It is made of uh, four different uh, works, and this is about um, the story of um, well, quite a um, uh, you know, it's quite strange, um, a weird kind of. Uh, play where the other people in town go around uh, finding and discovering uh, arrows. So the concept actually is quite simple. I asked the local people in Saitama Prefecture uh, to make, to produce arrows. It didn't matter what the material was, as long as it was an arrow, it was fine. And uh, there was a um, team of artists. I gathered uh, these uh, artists uh, to form a team. Uh, some of them were actors, so we had uh, photographers and uh, graphic designers, also architects as well as researchers, and also there's uh, costume designers. So this was a team of uh, such people, and we made preparation for this project, and we asked the local people uh, to make arrows. 
So it was almost like um, the local people were artists who were involved uh, in uh, the stage-related uh, arts uh, to make some, you know, uh, stage art uh, works. And uh, we asked them that it didn't matter what the material was. Um, you know, they produce and uh, make uh, arrows and uh, put the arrows um, by their house or near their homes. And the team of artists uh, would go around the town and take uh, photos of the arrows. Um, it was not as though the photos would be taken uh, to show uh, the photos uh, to the audience or the spectators, spectators on the spot, but the idea was to gather these uh, photos of the arrows. So here you can see a photo uh, of a transparent uh, arrow which, which was uh, made by a student. And this, was, this is uh, an actor. But uh, here, at this house, on the wall of the house, uh, this is an uh, arrow made of ivy. Also, this um, arrow was made uh, by the residents of the house. Here, there are four types of uh, arrows by the entrance. You can see those arrows. And uh, this is a cake shop. And you can see very closely to the top of the cake, and uh, there is actually one arrow here. And um, actually, it's a pie, and uh, you know, once uh, there's only one uh, piece of a pie available per day. So as long as there's one, you know, uh, pie sold, uh, it will be totally sold out. And uh, here, this is one district office, the local district government office participated. Can you see here on the glass window? There's an arrow uh, made of paper. Here I'm pointing to an art actor. And um, this is a shop selling contact lenses. And uh, this is a panel that uh, you can see to get the eyesight tested. And uh, this is an actor here. So again, arrows. And uh, this is a travel agent uh, called HIS. And um, HIS actually used the world map. And uh, these are the uh, little airplane models. And uh, they created an arrow. This, and this is an arrow made by a family. Uh, the father made an arrow, uh, uh, used uh, sake bottles. And um, uh, the little brother used um, uh, the brown uh, the stones, and the mother used um, uh, tree branches, and the elder brother uh, used, uh, created an um, arrow uh, at uh, school as part of the pottery class. And uh, this is an arrow which, uh, well, somebody made it, but it is not a work, but uh, this was uh, found uh, on the street. This is at the reception of a department store. So you can find arrows there. And this is an arrow made of uh, dry flowers, dried flowers, and uh, some st strings, also the same. This was um, created by a designer who did some design for a cake shop. And this is um, a dry cleaning shop. Can you see? It's, it was made of um, a clothes hanger. Uh, so it's an arrow made of a clothes hanger, and uh, this uh, is at the ca cafe, sandwiches, and uh, the cake, and the rice. Uh, so made of plant. It's uh, coffee beans. And uh, this was not made, it's not, it's not man made, but uh, right in the middle of the field, can you see a line here? And uh, after the other uh, rice uh, were uh, harvested, um, you know, somebody said that uh, this looks like a big arrow, and uh, here there's an actor. And this is also on the street, uh, this is a uh, arrow somebody made. This uh, arrow was made by a three-year-old uh, child uh, using for the very first time some paint. And this was at the top of a condominium building. Well, I'm sorry that the, the image is rather rough, but this arrow is made of daikon, the, um, the radish. So the radish, is, <laughs> the radish was dried and then made into an arrow. Um, there's some sweet potatoes. And uh, these are arrows made by some kids. And um, this is actually a textile, a uh, woven textile. Uh, 
and inside that uh, textile uh, you can find an arrow. So in this way, the local people came up with their own ideas because uh, as long as uh, they were uh, arrows, uh, they could uh, use any kind of uh, materials. So uh, in a way, in a nice way, I thought that they were rather crazy coming up with uh, wonderful ideas and making all sorts of arrows. And the artists, as I said, uh, they visited all these arrows and put uh, photos together, took photos with the actors uh, in the photos. And at the end, all these photos were collected and uh, exhibited on the walls uh, of a gallery inside a department store. So, of course, uh, the photos uh, were arranged nicely on the walls of this gallery at a department store. So, of course, um, uh, uh, this was not a performing arts, it was not a performance, but uh, in order to do this uh, project, I was uh, working uh, as a dramaturg, at least that was my intention, because uh, there was a team and uh, we created a concept, and the concept was shared with the team as well with the local people who were participating in the project. And these uh, local people, uh, we did not ask them uh, or, you know, force them uh, to contribute. Um, they were, you know, uh, participating as artists almost in order to make those uh, little small-scale arrows. And uh, as a result of that, uh, interesting uh, arrows were generated and created, and uh, we put them together. We were doing um, editing kind of work. So this is not a theatrical work, but um, I completely take this as a project uh, where I worked as a dramaturg in order to uh, inject uh, everything, um, utilizing the sensibilities as well as uh, the skills and knowledge and uh, the way of working as a dramaturg. So I have been using the title and working under the title of a dramaturg for 12 years. And in recent years, I have been using theatrical ideas or dramaturg-like ideas, not in a theater, but outside of the theater that has uh, become a very strong interest of mine in recent years. So lastly, I want to mention something which is quite relevant to what I have been talking about uh, so far. Well, you know there's a composer called Brian Eno, and um, he is a composer and a musician uh, who is known as the pioneer of the ambient music or the environmental music. And Brian Eno has uh, said uh, in an interview that uh, there are two types of uh, composers. One is a composer as an architect, architecture type of composer, Composition, and there's another type, composers as gardeners. This means that um, the gar architecture type of our composers is that um, they draw a design, they come up with a design and um, ask other people uh, to uh, cooperate and use other people's uh, skills and abilities in order to build and construct a building. So uh, the end result is based on a uh, design, uh, but um, composers as gardeners means that um, the composers actually um, plant seeds and uh, wait to see exactly what will come up in the end and to make all that process very interesting and find it uh, interesting uh, to nurture and to foster. I'm not saying that uh, one or the other is uh, better or worse, but I'm just saying that um, as part of the uh, collective work and uh, collaborative work, the second type of the composers as gardeners uh, is what I find more interesting. So I think that um, the work of um, being um, a dramaturg means that uh, as part of the, uh, the creation is to take care uh, of the work and the process of um, uh, making a work. So that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Professor Ekasol, please.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Eckersall, and um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Asian Dramaturgs Network and TPAM, Hong Yen, and to my colleagues for such a wonderful set of presentations over the last couple of days. It's been very stimulating. Um, so, I'm not a Japanese dramaturg, um, nor am I working here as a dramaturg, so uh, one might well ask the question, why am I on this panel? Um, but um, I, I was thinking that I would be, that my role might be to try and look at the question of, of dramaturgy in Japan through the lens of my work as uh, a Japanese theatre scholar. Um, in some ways, what I hope to do here is to show to some extent how dramaturgical thinking, which is an awareness of structures and forms in relation to context and agency, has shaped my understanding of Japanese theatre. So I'm very much talking about... Um, uh, I'm not talking about the dramaturg, I'm talking about dramaturgy here. And I think that needs to be very clear in what I have to say. Um, so in 2014, I was fortunate to convene the European section of the... Uh, uh, Europe, uh, sorry, the performing arts section of the European Association of Japanese Studies. And I chose to uh, write the call for papers uh, on the theme of dramaturgy. And I asked many of my colleagues who come from uh, the world of Japanese theatre studies to think about Japanese theatre through the lens of dramaturgy. So uh, here I'm talking about quite a diverse range of scholars from people who work on uh, ancient classical texts such as no or kabuki or bunraku uh, right through to people who work on modern theatre or people who work on the contemporary theatre. And in the call for papers, I wondered if we could think about Zayami's dramaturgy. Could we talk about Zayami's writings on theatre as a dramaturgy? Or could we talk about kata as dramaturgy, the forms that are associated with the kabuki theatre? To my surprise, actually many scholars took the theme uh, seriously and they really did address the question of dramaturgy in their papers. Um, so they took it seriously and began to think about their work on traditional theatre in more structural, analytical and formal terms. Indeed, we agreed that it was helpful to think about these classical forms of Japanese theatre as having dramaturgy and giving rise to dramaturgical practices and also, as a, as a follow-on from that, asking dramaturgical questions about these forms. So it was a kind of experiment that, uh, that uh, I think was productive in the sense that it enabled a set of questions to be asked about these forms that uh, uh, could be asked in a different way. They could be asked more from the perspective of practice of how these forms are practiced and what that relationship of practice has uh, to the existence of the form and its history and its present day understanding. Um, this is not really a picture of a conservative Norse scholar thinking dramaturgically, but uh, I couldn't resist the, the bad joke. So why not include Zayami's treaties on the actor or permutations of kabuki and jordidi as fundamentally dramaturgical. Why not appropriate the term? The term is, after all, a very complicated one in all fields. It's not necessarily a term that is very comfortable within Western theatre history either. Arguably, the history of Japanese theatre has a long history of thinking about, theorising and engaging with notions of time, space, narrative structure audience and the politics of theatre. So much that we can say much of this thinking is dramaturgical, whether we call it that or not. The experiment with my colleagues, conservative Norse scholars, for example, to think about their work on historically investigating and classifying Noll in terms of dramaturgy was an example of how we have already internalised dramaturgical thinking into our understanding of Japanese theatre. So uh, in some senses, I believe that this conference was productive because in fact, we were kind of naming a practice that we were already doing. Um, moreover, 
the history of modern theatre in Japan is important to consider in this regard. The pre-war avant-garde and political theatres were closely aligned with trends in Europe, so much so that the Japanese theatres of the time were introducing new aesthetic regimes in a way that was a form of co-located and dynamic implementation of modernity. I like to think about the early 20th century Japanese theatre not as a theatre that is, in a, I mean, the, 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 the normative practice is to think in terms of uh, second wave modernity or a copy of something. I, I, I think we should resist that kind of thinking. Um, this is an example of a co-located modernity, a modernity that's unfolding in theatre at the same time as it is in Europe. This figure here, uh, Muriyama Tomoyoshi, is a very famous Japanese uh, designer, playwright, director. Uh, he did many, many different practices, filmmaker and dancer. And uh, one of the things that he did was he wrote a book in 1930 called Essays on Proletarian Theatre in Japan. Published in 1930, it outlined a comprehensive model for theatre as a political vanguard. These essays were the first manifesto for theatre in Japan to combine the local perspective with a conception of utopian socialist internationalism. The book closely followed Piscator's arguments for a proletarian theatre, but my point is that this internationalization of a socialist aesthetic is also something that is very local, very much grounded in a situation that unfolded here in Japan in that time with its own particular conditions and its own particular dramaturgical in, uh, intensities. Um, one could argue that this relationship that Japan has to modern drama uh, makes Japanese theatre in the modern period inherently dramaturgical. And that's a point for another discussion, but it's something that I think is implicit in the presentation that I'm making today. The question of the relationship that Japan has to theatre in the modern period being one that is very aware of form makes that theatre very dramaturgical by nature. People might know that I've written extensively on the 1960s in Japan and this revolutionary era linked notions of social dramaturgy and protest with performance. Zero Jigen's Gishiki rituals, which are pictured here on the, on the, on the panel with the, the women with their hands in the air, um, was just one of many examples of performances that explicitly used bodies and bodily incursions into public spaces in a very overt political way. So this is dramaturgical thinking, I think, that is very prominent in the kind of work that's being done here. Artists producing these kinds of ruptures in the 1960s included Karajudo, Teriyama Shuji, High Red Center, Hijikata Tatsumi, and the list goes on. We could make a long, long list of artists who were thinking about the relationship between public space and social dramaturgy and uh, embodied performance practices. And uh, anybody who's known my work will know that I'm very interested in the kind of crossovers between the performance and the protest culture that was around at the time that was also highly performative. Perhaps we can summarise this kind of relationship in a very famous quote from the uh, uh, theorist um, Henri de Febvre, where he says, in the street, a form of spontaneous theatre, I become spectacle and spectator and sometimes actor. The street is a place to play and learn. The street is disorder. The disorder is alive. It informs, it surprises. Revolutionary events generally take place in the street. As a dramaturgy linking artist, protester and the everyday, this is a very good expression of the kind of dramaturgical intensity that I'm trying to talk about in 1960s performance. Yoshimi Shinya's Toshi no Dramaturgi, or uh, Dramaturgy of the City, published in 1987, I think updates this idea and gave us a very productive set of uh, conversations about the way that we could understand social dramaturgical practices in Japan. 
His work focused attention on social dramaturgy in work that is relevant to addressing civic performances and rituals as well as documentary theatre. Um, for uh, uh, Shinya's dramaturgy in the city outlined a proposition for a social dramaturgy of Tokyo and the influence of this work uh, takes in the notion of performance in the city and the city as performance. In other words, the city performs a certain kind of social dramaturgical practice for us. Takayama Akira, with his company Port B, and as well as a solo artist, has produced works that draw on, on documentary theatre techniques, art and social practice, and social dramaturgy to explore the relationships between uh, art, activism, and city life. Many people here are familiar with his work. For example, Takayama's Happy Island, The Masonic Banquet of the Righteous, is a video installation featuring a herd of cattle chewing curd and showing a cow being led through an evacuated town in the Fukushima radiation exclusion zone. The cow is being led by the, a farmer who owns the cows and uh, uh, he's seen in this image from the video wearing a, a Kyogen monkey mask. Um, the farmer has his farm in the exclusion zone and he refuses to slaughter his irradiated and unproductive cows. He's a farmer. These animals are supposed to be productive animals. They're supposed to produce uh, either milk or meat. And he refuses to slaughter his cows against the edicts of the government in order to make a point about the uh, misinformation that the government has... Uh, um, um, uh, it, the misinformation that, is, that has arisen out of the government's treatment of the victims, of, especially the people who are living in and around that exclusion zone in, in Fukushima. Um, another work here is the Tokyo Heterotopia Project, um, which uh, it, people participate in uh, an urban walking uh, um, journey, or actually you actually catch trains and you arrive at particular locations in Tokyo uh, where you can listen in on a local broadcast network that tells you the hidden stories of those places. Typically, they're places that include places where immigrants live, people whose lives are invisible in the daily life of Tokyo are made visible. And what we listen into is uh, a, some kind of conversation about their work or their life or the activities that are taking place in those places. Takayama's referendum project an ongoing documentary artwork to record interviews with school children about their responses to Fukushima is, he says, quote, an attempt to archive the fissures of our time. So I think these are very strong examples of a kind of dramaturgy of the city involving social practice that my colleagues have also talked about, Rimini Protocol, but also uh, the project that you, uh, my colleague was talking about uh, in the countryside with, with the local population. We could also look at Chiaki Soma's Theatre Commons Tokyo project as another important <laughs> reference. And I think one of the discussions around the conference in general has been the prominence of uh, so-called uh, social practice uh, uh, in relation to art, that uh, a lot of the examples of, of works that people have brought to this conference have been artworks that you could put in that kind of social practice context. And indeed, maybe, you know, we're, we're in the kind of social turn, as, uh, as, as it's been um, uh, called in, um, in uh, Japanese, in, not in Japanese, but in, in uh, theatre studies scholarship. I'm jumping around a little bit, but people have mentioned Hirata Eichiro's Dramaturgy, published in 2010, which introduced concepts from European dramaturgy to Japanese readers. And this was, uh, I think, the first substantial book on Jap uh, dramaturgy in Japanese. Um, uh, but uh, Hirata is a scholar of German theatre, um, and he's very much, uh, uh, I think, influenced by his understanding of German theatre as the kind of uh, gold standard of theatre. And uh, while his knowledge of German theatre is very rich and very deep, um, his book also raises questions, I think, for us to consider. 
what does it mean that one of the key texts on dramaturgy in Japanese has been written from a German theatre perspective? As we know, the history of dramaturgy splits into factions in modern theatre. German theatre history emphasises a legacy of dramaturgy that begins with Lessing and moves into the 20th century via Brecht, Heine Müller, and in recent times, Elfriede Jelinek. And while many of us, uh, I think uh, many of us are very influenced by this trend in theatre, um, and uh, um, uh, I, it, it is a question that we need to ask in terms of our own positioning in relation to our topic, that uh, you know, there is an Im implicit cultural narrative in, in much of the, the history of this work. Um, uh, we also mentioned already the training program in dramaturgy that was undertaken by Professor Fuji Shintaro uh, over here at Waseda University, which was perhaps one of the most sustained training programs in dramaturgy to be undertaken in Japan. It was developed, it aimed to develop an awareness of dramaturgy over a year-long series of workshops and symposia on the theme of dramaturgy held at Waseda University and funded as a major research initiative by the Agency for Cultural Affairs. This project included an extensive program of visits to Japan by dramaturgs from Europe and by scholars such as Hans Thies Lehmann and including myself who was also uh, um, very kindly invited to present at this uh, symposium. Much of the focus of this symposium was to better understand contemporary dramaturgical practices and I guess there's an implicit uh, connection there to so-called new dramaturgy practices, uh, the term coined by Marianne van Kerkhoven, the Flemish dramaturg, the late great Flemish dramaturg, who worked with so many contemporary theatre producers in Europe and she was, I think, one of the most important theorists of the con our contemporary understanding of dramaturgy. So much of this, I think, was introducing us in a very productive way to some of those ideas. But again, questions need to be asked about the directions of uh, uh, um, this kind of work. Uh, again, uh, you know, I principally work on this kind of theatre in my own practice and in my own co uh, th theoretical scholarship. But this work has come under critique for its sometimes its um, uh, perceived elitism. Certainly some of this work can be expensive. Uh, it is uh, imbricated into a global uh, festival infrastructure. All of these uh, uh, kind of contexts are uh, being challenged now by newer questions about dramaturgy and performance. Um, I'd just like to finish now to present a short, more detailed case study, in just in a little bit more detail. Um, um, and I know I've been jumping around, but uh, I think this is an appropriate point to end. Many of us are familiar with the work of the playwright and director, Okada Toshiki. Arguably, his work has shown a strong relationship to dramaturgy. For example, in his splitting of gesture and text in many of his works, especially in the early works, those of you who know his work know that uh, for a long time he worked with a company of actors where he taught them a particular method, or it was not so much a method, but a, a rehearsal process for developing his texts. He wrote his texts and directed them uh, in a way that created this very strong sense of dislocation between the spoken text and the physical vocabulary of the actor. And he also wrote about this as a, as a dramaturgical tendency in very interesting ways. And in recent works, he's occasionally adopted or co-opted the, the structure of a null play, a ghost play, in order to address in Ground and Floor, for example, his play about loss and Fukushima, uh, uh, a, a way of dealing with um, trauma and, and loss and memory. And currently he's in Germany, actually, and he's written a new uh, modern no play, which is being premiered at uh, the Munich uh, uh, Kammerspieler, I think, the, the main theatre house in, in Munich, which is a commission uh, of that theatre house for, for Okada to write and direct a play with the German ensemble. It's a three-year project where he's going to do three plays. So there's a very strong connection to dramaturgy in his work. And I've been writing about his, in his work in terms of 
uh, sensibility of ambient dramaturgy. Most recent, <laughs> Brian Eno is a good uh, reference point here. Most re recently in his 2015 play, God Bless Baseball. So I took this idea of ambience from a really wonderful book by Paul Roquet, who wrote about Japanese atmospheres of self. It's not a book about theatre, it's a book about sociology and, uh, and aesthetics. But uh, it's a book that talks about atmos uh, the ambience, the quality of ambience and how that sits in relation to Japanese society and culture. According to Paul Roquet, ambience serves to make strange the idea of the environment by stressing its subjective quality, refusing to equate it with a natural world order, uh, so a natural world existing independent from human agency. He also uh, connects ambience with the idea of neoliberal culture and says that uh, you know, we can fall into the trap of this kind of aesthetic reverie uh, uh, where we just get lost in the, in the sublime but uh, lose our, our critical distance and, uh, and our political perspective. Um, God Bless Baseball explores the game of baseball as a way to examine the complexities of the historical, cultural and political relationship between Japan, Korea and the United States. It is a self-described allegory and the play explores the histories of cultural imperialism, flows of culture, uh, flows of language, and very often miscommunication. And there's a quote there from the play, and I've got my time, I know. Towards the end of the play, the dramatic momentum stops, and we see, in said, we see instead something more akin to an installation artwork. And this is where I'm interested in this, you working in installation spheres, because I think there's a tendency in, in Okada's work uh, now, now where he shifts out of the dramatic structure into an installation practice. And he shifts the dramaturgy of the work from a, a kind of a, 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 a dramaturgy that's based in narrative and story into uh, a, a kind of uh, ambient uh, installation practice and in this play for example at the end of the play the text kind of stops and the set which is that parabolic an antenna which is a very ambiguous item in the, uh, in the play it starts to melt it starts to drip it starts to lose its structure and the play kind of stops as the, as the actors stand there and watch this thing melt and uh, there's a series of uh, uh, narrative devices which I don't have time to go into that explore this understanding of losing one's sense of self and moving into this kind of ambient space, this an ambient atmosphere. So the closing of the play has been described as a narrative of implosion and I wonder about the dramaturgical implications of this. Orkutta's work shows us a dramaturgy that is ambient where the expressive vocabulary of theatre is transformed into an uncanny, affective moment of implosion. This is a dramaturgical intervention that takes us into the internal aesthetics of Japanese theatre, in the sense that it could be like the end of a no play, which is also a moment of dramatic implosion. On the other hand, it's something that we understand through a more cosmopolitan, uh, post-dramatic, uh, perspective on dramaturgy and um, so what this means requires us to read the dramaturgy of the play and the play puts that as a key question in the closing moment because it stages the dramaturgy for us. It takes us out of the world of text and just says what you see is what you get now you have to think about it so it takes us to the dramaturgy a, a, a very material dramaturgy for us to consider. So um, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Ekasa from the historic development of uh, dramaturgy in Japan. He provided us with major findings and uh, uh, his presentation, his lecture is uh, inter related to the first two presentations. Before uh, I open the floor for questions, 
There are, of course, uh, various uh, issues presented by Professor Ekasal. So, uh, Mr. Nagashima or Mr. Hagiwara will you respond to what Professor Ekasal said. One thing that was uh, one thing uh, specific is uh, Mr. Hirata's book, and all of the three speakers talked about Mr. Professor Hirata's book, and that is a certain uh, model of Germany, and that German model had a big impact. In Japan, there has been a long-standing culture of a translation. So in UK and in US, there is a, a text manager. And uh, would that be possible to have somebody in that position? Dramaturgy in Japan uh, well, was discussed by Professor Ekasal. So how do you respond to Professor Ekasal's lecture? Well, one thing, well, yes, uh, there was a, a book on a dramaturgy written by Mr. Professor Hirata, and a German dramaturgy was uh, introduced at a time when there was an issue of environment for the producer. There was company. So the companies were the units of the uh, performance. And in the 1980s, 90s, the pr production system was uh, introduced. So the uh, public theater produced and uh, produced the uh, pieces of work. So this kind of production increased. So the uh, directors uh, became uh, isolated because um, they uh, did not work with uh, the usual people. And uh, instead, the uh, producers had to produce uh, pieces of work together with um, all different people. And under these circumstances, directors had to make decisions, and they tended to be isolated. Not all of the directors wanted to uh, work in this kind of environment. So because of this isolation of the director, perhaps uh, it had been uh, it would be better uh, for there to be one other partner to cooperate with the uh, directors. So that is a change in the early 2000s, and uh, Mr. Hirata talks about that in his book. And uh, I was uh, doing some of this work, so I started to be called a dramaturg. Or um, if I may make some supplementary uh, comment, this is the first time for me to come across the word text manager. After World War II in Japan, as uh, uh, Mr. Nagashima said, the system of companies eroded from the end of 20, uh, World War II and until 1980s, what is called Shingeki established uh, the companies. And um, half insiders from uh, Shingeki companies, half scholars, researchers, and uh, uh, scholars uh, uh, who are conducting researches of uh, uh, British, German, and the French literature uh, was involved in the company, and uh, they acted as an advisor. So in hindsight, in terms of the text management, uh, they were playing uh, a role as a dramaturg. And this is my additional information. Thank you very much. Uh, because of my uh, bad time management, uh, we are almost running out of time. But uh, I would like to open the floor for question. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone.
Well, thank you very much for your very interesting presentations. Let me ask my question in Japanese. I have a question to Professor Ekasa. In your slide, Eichiro Hirata's uh, dramaturgy, the spelling was interesting. And when I uh, hear dramaturgy is G-Y, that's the spelling I think about. But in English-speaking um, country, that may be G-I-I -I instead of G-Y, and that was interesting to me. When a dramaturg was introduced uh, in the UK, when Lawrence Olivier assistant, Travel from London to, uh, to Berlin, and uh, he brought that idea back to the uh, UK. In the uh, US and Australia, uh, were there any uh, reasons for this idea to be introduced based on some uh, needs? Thank you, thank you very much for your question. Um, It's Kenneth. I'm thinking of the somebody remind me of the guy who helped set up the National Theatre. Kenneth um, Olivia Tynan. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is. A, th I think there's a number of parts to your question. The f first one is. Um, um, I hope I translated the katakana correctly on the slide. I may have made a mistake, but I, as far as I know, that's how I didn't have the book with me when I made the slide, and I tried to find it on the internet but couldn't. So. Um, Broadly speaking, I think that this understanding of dramaturgy in the U.S., uh, based mainly in English-speaking cultures, is, has, uh, is the culture of the dramaturg as literary manager or text manager, as opposed to a dramaturg who uh, works in a production process in a collaborative way. Um, I think there are various historical reasons for this, but the, the figure of Ken Tynan is very important in this story because... He was somebody, as people know, he was very influenced by the work of Bertolt Brecht, uh, a great scholar of Brecht. He came back to Britain and was essentially sidelined in the establishment of the National Theatre in the, in the early 1960s by Laurence Olivier uh, because Olivier didn't think that there was a role for that kind of more politicised dramaturgy to take place in the British theatre and it was a kind of contest of ideas uh, Tynan lost. <laughs> um, uh, w whether we go on from that to then blame Laurence Olivier for the for the fact that you know, literary managers were, uh, generally speaking, the main dramaturgical role that's available in, in English-speaking theatres or not, I don't know. But certainly, if you look at the contemporary theatre and the, the 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 groups who make, I think, distinctive and original theatre, like for example not yet it's difficult or the work of David or many other people in Australia it's much more dramaturgical in a, in a more complex way and we've actually actively worked against that idea of dramaturgy being simply just well it's never simple but just being literary management yeah. another question over there Thank you for the presentations, uh, very interesting. And, uh, from various standpoints, uh, it was very uh, interesting to hear about Japan in dramaturgy. To dramaturgy. Um, and during the session of the dramaturgy in relation to dance, I was a speaker. Um, so this is not part of that. But when we look at uh, dramaturgy in the context of uh, Japan, of course, uh, you have to look into the, uh, the physical movement and um, uh, to look at, in, get that uh, into the thinking about dramaturgy is as important uh, in Japan. So the, uh, what you mentioned um, in uh, Professor Kasa or the, uh, the kata or the um, you no know, uh, performing arts, I think it's... Um, quite uh, um, you know, interesting, but it was very uh, difficult to verbalize uh, that. Um, so 
this uh, dramaturgy in German context, you know, how to put that into dramaturgy in the uh, German uh, context. I think that is uh, quite uh, challenging. Perhaps uh, this might uh, be done from now on uh, in terms of um, uh, dramaturgy in German context, as um, um, you know, Mr. Hirata has uh, written about. So I would like to uh, have your comment about um, uh, dramaturgy uh, in relation to the, uh, the physical aspect. And also at uh, Aichi University, um, in, there is a course on the, uh, the media uh, field. And there is a program uh, to educate um, uh, dramaturgs. And um, there is a person called um, uh, Satsuki Yoshino, uh, who is uh, teaching along with um, uh, Mr. Nagashima, who's also teaching at uh, Aicho University. So, because this is in the course of uh, media, so uh, this is to, well, educate uh, dramaturgs as uh, mediators. So I just wanted to make that as a supplementary information uh, comment. Thank you. So, related to your first part of the comment, which is a question, so, um, Professor Ekasai, would you like to respond? Um, I, I think I'd like to answer in two ways. Um, the first way is to acknowledge that the field of dance dramaturgy is a relatively new field of practice, and we're only now, I think, developing more understanding of the potentials of that field and how dramaturgs work in the context of contemporary dance. Um, specifically, though, in the Japanese context, we I would go back to the 60s and think about the provocations that were made for the body in Angora theatre, you know, Karajuro's work on privileged body, Hijikata's testing of the limits of the body, um, these very political statements that were made about the body, um, um, I've always responded to as very strongly dramaturgical interventions, even though they might not be called dramaturgy. So, Mr. Nagashima. So, um, from a different perspective, um, perhaps I can respond uh, to that uh, question. I hope that I can answer it. And uh, also, I wanted to ask a question uh, to um, uh, Professor Ekasal. Um, what is not as part of a text? Uh, you know, how should we look at that? And how should we deal with that? What is not in the text? And um, in the audience, um, um, there is um, uh, Yokoyama-san from uh, SPAC. Um, and uh, Yokoyama-san mentioned, and uh, going back all the way to um, uh, Greek language, uh, drama is an action, and uh, one needs to regard that as very important. Um, you know, what Yokoyama-san mentioned made me realize that. Because um, we often think about text means just a script. But uh, if it is all about action, dramaturgy is um, looking at uh, what a series of uh, moves and movements uh, would um, be leading uh, to a certain meaning and uh, significance, and then uh, taking um, different standpoints and different um, positions to uh, look into that. So um, it's only an action, a part of an action, uh, what the actors do, what is not verbal, what is not um, put together as uh, words how dramaturgy or how dramaturgs uh, would uh, take care of that and uh, what kind of approaches and uh, thoughts go into that. I think these are all important. Also, another point which might be related to this is that, um, well, the Zeami dramaturgy or what is not uh, part of the, uh, the theater, uh, even in the uh, old um, you know, folk tales of uh, Japan, you find something uh, similar or similar kind of types. And uh, also, there's uh, even social uh, type of uh, dramaturgy uh, too. So what can be read as a dramaturgy you know, in the post-process? And also there's a dramaturgy that uh, you can embrace and uh, you know, uh, look at during the process. So that's what is the point that made me think about uh, those things uh, while I was attending this session. So there's a dramaturgy that you read and uh, interpret and analyze, and uh, you can find a meaning in it. And there's another kind of uh, dramaturgy uh, where the, uh, the creators uh, manipulate or you know, operate in order to create um, certain meaning or significance. So I think that um, for me, uh, during the process, how 
in certain things can be utilized for whatever end. That is where my uh, interest lies. Uh, that is the only thing. And, um, and that is all, you know, very important to me. But as a re- end result, um, if there is a work, um, you know, that uh, you can focus something else uh, as part of the dramaturgy, this is quite a different from Zeami, uh, because uh, usually there's a text, and you know what you read from the text uh, is different. And how can we go back in history and uh, time to um, you know read and find uh, that um, uh, you know meaning uh, from the text? So that was the point which occurred, occurred to me while I was listening to um, Professor Casal's um, uh, presentation. Well, fortunately, I'm not a scholar of Zayami, um, but uh, what I was interested in doing was provoking. Uh, a different kind of thinking about um, the critical scholarship in No, because it is overly concerned with uh, very accepted notions of history and actually it's overly concerned with categorization. So if you go to a conference of scholars on No, they're very much concerned with categorizing certain kinds of forms certain kinds of images. Uh, and what I was interested in was provo- trying to provoke a commentary around um, the socio-cultural context of those forms. Or what does it mean that uh, an ancient form that has a canonic- can- canonical uh, status is only studied in terms of its categories? Why don't we think of it in other ways? Why don't we think of it in ways... And to think about dramaturgy... Uh, for me anyway, means that we have to think about the practice of the form, maybe in historical terms, but but very much also it takes us to the contemporary relevance of those forms and, and the comment and the questions that we can ask about what that form's doing now. Um, and that's why, I, you know, it's interesting that we're seeing this revived interest in no as a form once again by contemporary writers. I mean... In the 50s, with Mission is No Place, but Comrade Takeshi wrote modern no plays in the 1990s or early 2000s, early 2000s, and now Okada's very explicitly taking this form because for him, I think it offers. A, well, I don't speak on behalf of him, but for, what I'm seeing is is that it enables him to say things that can't be said in other ways, and and it's the dramaturgy of that form. He's not taking an ancient no play, he's taking the form, the structure, and, and applying it to his own sensibility. And I think that's, that's the provocation that I was trying to look for in that, um, uh, that session that we had on the dramaturgy of, of, of Japanese theatre. Well, uh, we can go on and on uh, with this discussion around this uh, theme, but it's already four. But if there's one uh, last uh, question, we'd like to entertain that before ending this session. Can we have a microphone? Thank you very much for the very uh, interesting talk today. I well, uh, the uh, what uh, dramaturgy is. Uh, uh, well, I have uh, come to know that uh, today, with respect to dramaturgy, uh, people who are involved in it, uh, actors, the uh, directors, uh, maybe uh, they uh, go to the ground from a different uh, uh, position. So, uh, as a sense, as we look at uh, the direction of the modern or contemporary uh, theater, and also how. What sort of a roles uh, dramaturgy will play in the coming period? How that uh, will fare in the coming period? That is uh, what I would like to know. Thank you. So perhaps uh, very brief comments from each of you. How it will uh, turn out, I want to know that uh, very badly. Uh, very briefly, well, uh, two points, uh, very short comments. One, 
The uh, theater is a mirror uh, that uh, reflects the world. Uh, that's Hamlet. Well, if it is true, I think the uh, uh, world is very complex. The speed is fast. The information runs fast. Uh, there is also fragmentation that is going on. And so this is a very complex and fast-moving world. And the individual artists, whether can, we can reflect that. So in this respect, uh, the possibility of a collective uh, uh, production is uh, has a potential mediators or the uh, gap filling people or uh, caretaker well in many ways a dramaturg uh, can s play uh, some roles here that is point number one and the other point number two uh, this uh, has to do with what I said earlier for theater the knowledge is skills for theater uh, will be used uh, that's uh, a waste so I think uh, we have to go out we should go out, and uh, uh, collaboration uh, should happen outside of our world, not just amongst professionals, but uh, perhaps uh, with amateurs, uh, people on the street. Uh, I think I see uh, potential there. Well, I think uh, that's a good segue to what I want to say. Uh, well, what kind of uh, theater should be played in what uh, context? I think uh, that's a key to the development, further development of dramaturgy. So as uh, mentioned many uh, times, social dramaturgy is uh, a very good uh, keyword here. And also people on the street, on that point, uh, posterior, well, not uh, well, as uh, Mr. Nagamixiba said, the dramaturgy in the process. If we can uh, rack our brain around that, uh, well, dramaturgy uh, that uh, uh, in, is enduring or uh, ongoing, uh, well, uh, the, uh, that uh, could spread. That's so, sort of my sense about uh, the uh, protocol. From protocol. Thank you. I'm also in general agreement that, the, that I think the potential for dramaturgical thinking is to uh, take our practices into many other locations and many other kinds of practices. So at a conference on dramaturgy, we've seen artworks that take place in theatres, in the street, in art galleries, in hotel rooms, in media, in data space. And we've also had a series of reflections on that, which I think are also dramaturgical, writing about work, uh, debating about work, having conferences, I see also as being uh, a dramaturgical um, activity. And so I would like to see uh, the, the, these kind of applications of dramaturgy expand into the future as well. Thank you very much. So at uh, Asian Dramaturgs Network, uh, to all the such a pos uh, potentials, we'd like to move forward. Thank you very much for your petition today. Please give another big round of applause to the panelists once again.